morning, everyone. Um, my name is Anthony Bordero, and I'm with the SPE Kirby Basin. Um, it's 11:30, but we're going to give folks a few more minutes to trickle in, and so I'll probably kick off around 11:35. Um, so grab a drink and get ready to enjoy this awesome lecture or webinar. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask. Well, so I'll come back on at 11:35 and uh, kick up, hand it off to Ellie, and then we can uh, get this going. Thanks. All right, y'all, it's 1135. Let's get this started. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for making out today. Uh, it's, it's the September 30th, right? Yeah, sorry. Um, and my name is Anthony Gordon here, and I'm with the SP Permian Basin Data Lake Study Group. Today we have Ellie, Ard, I'm going to try to pronounce this right, Ardikani from Meta 
here to talk about how they're using data science uh, and applying it to micro seismic data to enable engineers to generate some actionable and uh, changes they can make to improve their operations and how they operate. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we started. Uh, we'll do a Q and A at the end of this presentation. Uh, and so if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them in the little GoToWebinar window or the pane on your right of your screen, and we'll be addressing those towards the end. You can also raise your hand, um, and then towards the end, we'll be doing a Q&A session uh, with a mixture of ones asked live, the people raise their hands, and also any ones that are submitted uh, into the window. And then anything we're not able to answer during the Q&A session, uh, Ellie will get follow up after email or some method. So just don't worry if you don't get your question. Um, looking forward to this topic and uh, yeah, it should be fun. Without further ado, I'd like to turn over. I'll turn it over to Ellie to uh, to talk, and she's the CEO and co-founder at Meta. All right, let me. Yeah. Perfect. So I do have my webcam, so I'm going to put it on my picture. <laughs> I will turn it off soon. Um, thank you so much, uh, Anthony and Ronnie, for, for running this webinar. I'm so glad uh, for you guys who could make it to this talk. Um, can't wait to start. Um, if you would like to reach out to me, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address is here, our website, um, or on Twitter. Um, just a little bit of a background on me. Um, I'm a geophysicist by training. Um, I got my PhD from U of A um, up in Canada um, uh, a couple of years back. I can't even remember. Um, but uh, one of the things that I want to put things in perspective a little bit, because we're talking about micro seismic data um, and how we can we can connect the dots for operators that are using these sort of data sets. Um, is I have a background working in um, in operator companies, in offshore and on onshore oil and gas companies, um, and also for a service company. Um, just before I started Meta uh, with a good bunch, uh, three years ago, I actually worked in a micro seismic company as um, an R&D geophysicist, where I was in charge of building algorithms that help reservoir characterization um, using micro seismic data. And uh, one of the things that always came to my mind was that there was so much money and so much energy spent on collecting data sets and processing the data sets, but then those data sets are not getting used uh, beyond that project. Um, and I always wondered why. Um, and part of the reason that uh, at Meta, what we are doing right now, uh, bringing in new technologies um, into the applications of engineering and geosciences, that's, uh, that's the motivation behind it. So I'm just going to close my camera here. And then we can go to the presentation. As um, Anthony mentioned, if you have any questions, just type it out. If we can't get um, your answer today, I would be more than happy to follow up with you later on. Um, today, we're going to talk about AI augmented analytics uh, for micro seismic data to bridge the gap between uh, the data and business value. Um, this work has been done at Meta with my colleagues, um, and I'm representing them today. So first of all, we're going to talk about a process, which is technically a, a broken process. Um, in, in terms of micro seismic data, the way that it works usually is that, let's say I'm an operator. I go and um, invest my money in acquiring the data through a vendor. Um, in this case, it's a micro seismic vendor. Um, we collect the data and we bring it to the office. Um, in a consumable format, usually Excel sheets, um, usually those dots that you see on the map. And we try to solve the puzzle of reservoir characterization and the effectiveness of our completions. And if you're um, really careful and really um, uh, persistent about getting value out of our data sets, this process will go on and on in a circle. So 
you you acquire the data for one pad, you can use that data for that specific pad, but then later on when you have a second project, you bring in more data sets and then you compare and correlate with the other pads that you already completed. Um, and if you do that, we can come up with an excellency in our operation and in our completion programs that not only is going to save us money, but also makes us money. This is the ideal world. Um, the reality is um, this circle is broken. Um, this loop is broken. When we usually use our um, data sets for one project, it doesn't go beyond that. Um, and therefore, we can come up with better ways to complete our, our wells based on what our geophysical data sets are telling us. So let's put it in monetary values. Um, on average, a market seismic project costs about $0.5 million. Um, and that's a really, really um, small value compared with a lot of big projects that are happening out there. If over the last 10 years or over the last decade, um, an operator had about 50 projects that they acquired micro seismic data, which most of the companies that are operating in Fermion Basin do have that uh, number of projects, it's about $25 million. So it's $25 million worth of data that is sitting somewhere on a, on a hardware, on, on, a, on a cloud, in a project, in a software, um, and it's not used beyond, beyond that specific project. Um, we actually did a survey with 25 operators within um, Permian Basin, and 95% of the companies um, told us that the data, that the market seismic data that is acquired and processed will not be looked at after three months that the completion is over. Um, usually that's the case for a lot of the data sets that are getting acquired. So the question here is, why is this process broken? Number one reason is the accessibility. Um, we are in the pain of bringing digital technologies and you know, connecting with the data sets and connecting with the processes more than ever right now in this industry. But at the same time, we still have issues with accessibility to the data. That means that if you are a geo or an engineer and you want to compare and correlate different projects, you need to have the data sets and the insights that are generated from them at your fingertips. And that is not the case right now. Um, the number two is consumability. A lot of these data sets are acquired by different vendors um, they're usually not consistent in the way that they are provided. Um, and the operator has to make sure that the data that they are using in their processes are QC. Um, so if it's not, then you do have a problem with the, the format of the data set and its consumability. And the third one is human limitation. Um, imagine you're juggling so many projects and you're doing so much work and then you have to look into 50 projects that have micro seismic data to tease out some sort of a pattern or trend or something that relates back to your production and completion. Um, it's just not possible. So um, that these, these three are the main reasons behind why this process is broken. But we can fix it. And we believe that we can fix it with all these new technologies that are coming in, AI included. AI is not a new thing. I did my master's degree years ago um, using neural networks to predict um, reservoir characteristics. But the thing that is really new with them is the way that they are delivered to, to end users. Um, and we we're going to talk about it very uh, soon. But as you can see on this triangle, I have data and AI on the bottom and I have expertise on the top. And one thing that I want to mention, which usually is missing uh, or often is missing, is the expertise. So as petroleum engineers or, or geophysicists or geologists, our expertise are very crucial into building algorithms uh, that, that, that can get value out of our data sets. 
Um, and for us at Meta, we put the expertise on top of this triangle because without these domain expertise, um, our AI algorithms are just generic algorithms, right? So today we're going to talk about two of these AI augmented technology, and I keep calling it augmented because these are AI algorithms that are augmented by expert opinion. And that's why I, have, why the, I am calling them AI augmented technology. Um, we talk about two um, algorithms and its application. Um, the first one is data quality intelligence. We call it for short DQI. And the second one is pro SRV, which is for estimating um, the simulated reservoir volume that is productive or has the highest potential for production. So let's just start with DQI. Um, in a typical, for some of you that are not familiar with microseismic acquisition, in a typical optimum recording network, um, we have multiple arrays that help us to, to acquire microseismic data. Um, it could be surface or it could be downhole. Here in this picture, you can see that we have two vertical monitoring um, arrays, and we do also have a VIP array, which um, a couple of these sensors are at the end um, of the well, uh, from the from the heel to to the to the vertical uh, section of the horizontal well. Um, Usually for downhole sensors, we use 15 hertz um, 3C geophones, three component geophones. Um, if you want to go a little bit further and have a better um, coverage, usually you can have some shallow four and a half hertz geophones. And then if you want to go a little bit beyond that and have a really optimum recording network, you can have some surface geophones um, or even you can have uh, better broadband geophones on the surface, um, if not just um, multiple stations. So let's say we went ahead and acquired the data for this project and the data set looked like this. This is what most of the end users and operators will see. There are a bunch of dots in the space. There are microseismic clouds. Um, and now the question for operators are, okay, which part of this data set is um, I can use in my processes. And we're gonna to get to that. But before we do that, um, I wanna talk about a little bit about what microseismic data um, is and what is provided by the vendor to the operator. Um, so microseismic data, um, it's technically seismic signals that are um, created or propagated from the seismic sources, which is technically um, a fracture shearing. Um, under the subsurface in subsurface uh, due to the simulation program. Uh, so you're putting pressure in the rock and the rock breaks um, or uh, you know the already existing fracture moves and that creates a seismic signal that is received on the recording network. Now we have multiple attributes for Mark's seismic data. The first one is location and that's the one that everybody's familiar with. Um, when you receive your market seismic data from the vendor, you receive location, which is technically X, Y, Z or coordinates of the event. Um, you get the azimuth and you get distances. The azimuth is technically what would be the azimuth of the event from the stages that they were um, acquired for. And the distances could be between the events and monitoring system or between the events and um, the stages that uh, are related to them. The second category of things that we would receive are primary attributes, and that's what it comes in microseismic catalogs. Uh, most of the things that you heard of probably are moments and magnitude and energy, but there are so much more into these attributes that you can actually get from the data, uh, but just looking at the spectrum of seismic signals. Um, things like um, signal noise ratio, corner frequency, the number of the picks, um, and some of the things that actually goes into the processing, which are helpful. The last category are advanced attributes. Um, these attributes are technically calculated from the primary um, attributes and with more, um, more experimentation with the signals that are actually acquired. So things like moment tensors, seismic efficiency, apparent stress, fracture orientation. 
uh, but in this talk, we're just going to focus on the on the first two categories. So when you receive the data, you usually get the data as an operator, as a macroseismic event catalog, which is technically a spreadsheet. And each column is indicative of one of these attributes that you are, we were just talking about. And also, if you're persistent, you can get your signals, um, the signals of associated with the events that were recorded and the picks, which means uh, where the arrivals were picked using the, the software that the vendor was using or the algorithms that they were using. In most of the cases, you can't actually look at the picked signals uh, if you're an operator. It's almost impossible because you have to have a hefty software for processing and also very, very time consuming to do so. So most of the people just think about the Marcus Heisman event catalog as the output of these projects. However, on average, one third of the macroseismic data sets suffer from serious processing artifacts, uh, which leads to faulty interpretation. Um, a lot of these things can be um, prevented, uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the time is short, the turnaround is short, um, the vendors are busy, uh, there's so many factors that goes in, and that's almost kind of a thing that you need to do after the project is, is done to make sure that your data is actually cleaned up and stored um, in, a, in, a, in a clean up space that you can actually use in later time. So going back to QSing microseismic data, um, and as we were talking about it, the first type of doing it is examination of the signal. So remember, as we were talking about, uh, you know, the signals on the picks, um, you can look at the first arrival picks, the processing window length, the spectral fitting models, how they are fitting uh, the signal, um, the azimuth analysis, there's so many things that you can have a look at. However, this process is very, very time consuming um, and it needs a lot of expertise. So you have to have the expertise, you have to have a hefty software for actually looking at, to, at the signals and fixing the issues with them. And, you have to have a lot of time. And just to put things in perspective, if you spend one minute on every event to fix up your processing issues, if you have 40,000 events for one uh, path, it takes 40,000 minutes, which means 600 hours almost, which is one third of a working year, 30,000 to $40,000. It's almost impossible. The second way of doing the QC is examination of catalogs and the attributes that you're receiving from, from the vendor. Um, and the way that experts will do it is to follow the rule of thumbs, to plot up the data and extract the relationships and trends between these attributes and see where the irregular, irregularities are that um, will tease out issues with the data sets. Um, again, you need to have expertise. Um, you need to know how to code and slice and dice your data set, and it is still time consuming. However, it's way less than time consuming than the first way of doing the QC. So we're going to go with the second category. However, what if, it, if I tell you that the AI can actually help us to democratize the expert knowledge and make this process much faster for our projects? And this is where we're talking about putting microseismic data QC on autopilot. This is where we're adding the expert knowledge, the person who's looking at these rule of thumbs and relationships, and taking it to an algorithm, uh, which here we are using gradient boosting trees, and there is a reason behind it, which is supervised machine learning algorithm to, to label our data sets as reliable and unreliable and QCR data sets um, for, for adjacent paths. Um, so I, I, I just said that we're using boosting um, approach for, for this machine learning model. Um, and the reason for it is that it, because this approach is an ensemble model, it, it, it learns little by little from the weak learners and it builds a model that ends up to be very strong when it comes to figuring out um, the, the 
final results or the labels for us. So here we're just looking at how the decision trees are made and how in every layer another decision tree is going to be added to the first one, which minimizes the error for the training data set, uh, for the training error uh, for our algorithm. And this goes on and on and on to a point that the algorithm uh, will end up building a decent quality model that we can test on our, our data. Um, so let's go back to the data set that we were just talking about. Um, here are three wells and the events are seen in, in orange, about 40,000 events. This is WolfCamp. Um, we divided up the data, 40% uh, for training, 30% for validation, and 30% for testing. There are a couple of tuning parameters that goes to GBT or gradient boosting trees. Um, and there could be more than this, but just to simplify it, um, we talk about the training set size, um, and that's just the percentage of the data that goes um, for training the model. Obviously, you don't wanna have a huge training uh, set, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that you have a variety of events um, and features included in your training set. So if you're, if you're a microseismic data set, if you're using a 40% of the microseismic data set for training, you wanna make sure that that 40% includes really, really good quality events and really, really good processed events versus really um, bad processed events or weak events so that the model will get exposed to everything that you have in your data set. The learning rate um, technically just describes the step size in the machine learning algorithm, uh, and then you have the number of estimators, uh, which is in the opposite um, relationship with learning rate. So if you have a really small learning rate, you have a higher number of estimators. And the estimators are technically um, the number of iterations that um, the features are used to produce uh, your final model that you're using. And then we have some smoothing functions and parameters to reduce the overfitting of training data, um, but penalizing the outliers. Um, one more important part of this process is to make sure that the machine learning model that is built here is appropriately fit. Um, it's not underfit or overfit or overtrained. Um, and with that, what I mean is, if you look at this plot here, and this is a root mean a square um, error plot, you can see that the, the error will go down as you are adding uh, the number of estimators, right? And then at some point um, here, you can see that for the validation uh, data, which is in orange, it kind of flats out. This is a really good model, it's appropriately fit. But then if you look at the underfit model and overfit model, you can see that for the underfit model, the error just goes down as much as the training error goes down. Um, and there is no flattening out um, of the error with the number of decimators um, adding up. Uh, and on, in the overfit model, um, it's called almost the opposite. So the validation error actually starts to go up as the number of decimators are um, going up. So that's an important thing to have in mind. And then you have the importance plot, which shows technically the, the key attributes that are and features that are used in the model that we are building. Uh, at the same time, you have to look at um, things like confusion metrics, which is just a plot to show what portion of the data was labeled correctly and what portion of the data was not labeled correctly. So I have a little um, GIF here, which hopefully is gonna work. Okay, there you go. Um, so it, it shows such an application. Um, you have the data set in, in, your, um, in this dashboard. Um, you can actually see how you can go through and choose um, what attributes and what features are used in this, in this model and you can actually train your own model here um, using this application. Um, here we are using area under curve for evaluation method, and it takes about maybe a couple of seconds and it, or maybe a minute if the data set is really huge, 
um, to run through training the, the model and loading the data. And then you can actually look at the classified events, uh, which here you, you can see the, the unreliable data sets are shown in red and the reliable data sets are um, shown in green. So if I turn off the unreliable, you can see how the reliable data looks like. And it looks much more consistent and clear um, with, with the well that was treated. Now, if you go to the prediction tab, um, this path in Loving County was very close to another path. Um, and we are using the same model that was produced uh, for, for the previous path that you, we were just looking at, uh, which here is shown in yellow um, on this map we can use that model, which is imported into, into this dashboard um, for predicting the labels for the second project. So all it takes, we're just going to, to do the prediction here. And in a couple of seconds, uh, we can see our classified events for the adjacent path. Um, in, in this project, in this, um, in this path, we actually have more than one monitoring well. So we actually have three monitoring wells. And obviously the number of the unreliable um, events are actually smaller, way smaller than um, the previous project that we were looking at. And that's how fast it could be to, to actually use a model um, that is built using your data sets for another project. All right, so um, just a couple of things to, to point out here. Um, you can see number one uh, key attribute in the importance plot being magnitude. Um, you can see how the error flattens out uh, with adding the, adding the number of estimators, which means that this model is appropriately fit. And then you can see how we have more than 96% or about 96% of the labels being predicted correctly. Um, so looking at the data on the side view, um, you can see the reliable data set, the unreliable, and the mixture of the labels um, with 96% of prediction accuracy. And then if you look at the predicted labels with this algorithm DQI in the path two, which is the adjacent path, as we were talking about it, um, you can see how they look like. So in terms of how DQI can help, the number one is the automation. Um, the QC is a very, very tedious task um, and usually it's just not given enough attention, unfortunately, and that is not a good thing. Um, with using these algorithms, we can actually go through large data sets um, and predict their, their quality based on the models that we are building and then we can use it on multiple data sets in the same asset, um, which is really powerful. These applications, which are like the latest technologies coming in, are helping us to put all the data at our fingertips and work with it. Um, this algorithm works with any microseismic data set, that, data set that you would have, regardless of who the lender is, because it's using the same features and attributes. Uh, it provides an in-house tool for the operator to examine the data quality in a consistent manner. And that's something that was always missing from the industry, to be honest with you. Um, and we think that this will empower the operator to actually sit in the driver's seat uh, for once and, and, you know, take care of their data sets um, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, so now we're going to move to to the to the augmented technology, um, the second augmented uh, AI augmented technology piece that we are talking about here, and that's Pro SRV, um, which we are using an algorithm to predict, not predict, but calculate and compute the collective rock plastic deformation, which is inferred from microseismicity um, in 4D. And when I talk about 4D, it's technically seismic 4D, so it's space and time, X, Y, C, and time, to give us a logical estimation of productive SRV. Unfortunately, uh, majority of times, uh, when we come up with uh, the, the SRV values that are coming out of Mark Seismic data sets, they make no sense. They're in terms of billions of cubic feet, uh, which if you think about it, 
um, it's ridiculously high. Uh, and part of the reason is that the data, the events are just shrink wrapped, right? Um, they, it's just the area that encompasses the microseismic event without noticing that some of these events are not actually contributing or not indicative of effective simulation of reservoir. And that's what this algorithm distinguishes here for us. The process is kind of straightforward. Um, so you got you got your data from the DQI coming out, clean data set, bias free, uh, that you can rely on. You use that data in a machine learning in a machine learning clustering algorithm, which is uh, k nearest neighbor. So technically, the algorithm looks into um, events with similarities in the space and time and cluster them together. And then using those, we can calculate plastic deformation. The deformation that we calculate is associated with the moment and the energy that is dissipated from, from the microseismic events when they are occurring in a volume of rock. And then we come up with a statistical cutoff and then we can, uh, pre we can, we can prepare the productive simulated volume for a specific projects that we are looking into. So just talking a little bit about the statistical approach and how it works. Microseismic events um, on their own, if you're looking at induced seismicity um, and they're actually earthquakes, they matter, even if there is only one, right? Because they are, they are big in size, the magnitude is high, and they could, they could harm the environment and human life. So, that's a different scenario. But here, in the context of hydraulic fracturing, looking at microseismic events, one event is not telling you much. But when you put it in a collective, if you look at it in a collective way and looking at how they are distributed in time and space, you can get much more out of this data set for characterizing your reservoir. So on the right here, you can see how um, you know the the, the the events are kind of diffuse, getting more diffuse as they are getting away from the wellbore, which makes sense because if you look at the background picture here, in terms of fracturing, you can see closer to the wellbore, you're technically crumbling the rock. And as you get away from it, uh, these fractures, existing fractures are getting more and more isolated, right? So these events that are happening here, which are more um, tensile um, shear events, are more related to the active pumping and the stimulation program than the ones that are happening back there, which mostly are stress induced. And that's what this algorithm is going to do for us in recognizing these. This 4D machine learning um, algorithm, what it does, it goes through space and time and chooses the nearest um, events to that specific event. In, in, in the context of hydraulic fracturing, to be honest with you, I've seen people putting events that are happening in post-pumping beside the events that are happening right at the beginning of pumping, like literally the stage one of, of the, uh, the pad one of the stage. And that just makes no sense because the processes are so different for the post-pumping events compared with the events that are happening right at the beginning when you're hitting the rock with fluid. And then they change when the fluid, you know, um, the propellant is added to the fluid, right? So making sure that the events that we are looking at in each one of these clusters, you know, they are related in time, that's a big deal. And I think in hydraulic fracturing, because everything is so fast paced, um, more than maybe events that are between five to 10 minutes, they are kind of related together in terms of the processes that are happening. But beyond that, they're usually not. Um, so in this picture, you can actually see the centroid of this cluster. So these are not events. They look like events, but they're not events. They're actually the centroid of the clusters that I think they are about 20 events in each cluster. And this is the cluster data for one of these wells. Um, we can con compute the deformation very quickly based on an optimized algorithm that we have for computation of the deformation on every single one of these, one of these clusters. And then it, it's getting mapped out um, and um, interpolated on this map 
um, you have to make sure that when you're looking at these maps, um, you are aware of artifacts such as edge effects and, and smoothing. So um, you usually want to look at, you know, which are the areas that are highly deformed and which are the areas that are not highly deformed. Uh, the more deformation, it means that your simulation was more effective in those specific stages, and that's something that you can tie to other data sets that you are acquiring, such as such as DAS uh, fiber data, or um, if you have pressure gauges um, or tracer or those sort of things. And then at the end, that the algorithm will provide you with. Um, uh, ISO surface around every single stage or if you want around the well board that shows the, the productive SRV. These values are way smaller than the values that usually are provided by the vendors um, because we are looking at a statistical, um, we are looking at a statistical approach. We're taking a statistical approach for looking at seismic events and the seismicity uh, as it's occurring uh, in subsurface. So I have a little GIF here that kind of shows how this works. Um, we, uh, this is an application that you can actually go through and set up your own uh, desired values to do the clustering, um, choose parameters that are, you know, they could be experimental. You can, you can just experiment with it, uh, but it takes about Maybe if the data set is really huge, it takes about a couple of minutes. Um, if it's not, it takes a couple of seconds. And then you can actually have your calculated deformation for the specific wells um, and your cluster data and also your um, productive SRV around each stage. All of this data can be exported to other software and um, other processes that you are using. So I have a couple of final words here. Um, I think that just to wrap up um, this conversation or this talk, uh, there is always so much complaints about little return on investment on, on micro seismic data sets. And part of it is that uh, because the operators are not given the power uh, to actually dig into their data in a way that they should, um, the data sets are biased, they are inconsistent, and they are not QC. And you know, if you have multiple data sets, lack of consistency can be a killer. If you don't have a centric um, database that you can hold all of your information there and all of your insights there, uh, and projects are kind of like disparate, they, you won't be able to actually use them the way that you should. Um, so going back to the to the to the first slide that I presented, this this process is kind of broken. Um, and unfortunately, because the process is broken, you can't actually use those data to do predictive work for the future. So let's say you have adjacent paths and you have your completion program done um, and you have the micro seismic data for these sort of, for a couple of these projects, you can actually have a look at them. And if you do have PLT data, if you have some production data, you can compare them with pro SRV uh, results to come up with um, a prediction of, hey, like what if, if I drill a well or if we complete the path you know, to the north of this area, what is going to happen there? Predictive work is possible if we are actually using our data sets in the way that we should. And AI augmented technology can help with this problem. Um, these Technologies such as DQI and ProSRV that I just talked about, they make expert knowledge accessible. And that's something that it's, it's really hard to, to find uh, when it comes to, to the um, processes that goes on in the operator side. And it connects the operating engineers and geos, which are the end users, with trusted microseismic data and analytics. To, to be able to drive continuous value throughout the, the asset lifetime in a short time frame. I think one of the key takeaways from these approaches that we are using for looking at data is the fact that 
it saves many and many and many hours and days of work because they are automated um, and that's the beauty of it. Um, with that, um, I really uh, appreciate you being here in this talk. Um, I think we're going to look at uh, to see what questions we have and we can answer. But um, at the same time, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm available um, through my email or LinkedIn. Just send me a message and we can definitely chat a little bit more. Uh, we have more technologies in the pipeline. Um, these are just two of them, but it was just wouldn't fit within the, the time limitation here. All right, thank you very much, Ellie. Um, great presentation, I really appreciate it. Um, hi, I'm Ronnie Arispe. I'm uh, also part of the SPE uh, Permian Basin chapter of the Data Analytics Study Group um, and from Concho Resources. Um, I'll be emceeing the uh, Q&A, so you have uh, a couple of options. You can either raise your hand and I will uh, unmute you and allow you to ask a question in person, or you can also type your question on the question panel and I can read it aloud for you. So if you'd like to go ahead and uh, start doing that, uh, we will go through the Q&A session now. Okay, we have a question. Um, it is, uh, what are the next steps uh, with the work you're doing, especially in the Permian? So um, we we were lucky enough, and I think uh, some of the operators are forward thinkers enough uh, to to actually trust this technology and provide us with um, multiple data sets from multiple uh, multiple areas in Permian Basin. Uh, and what we are doing, we are building um, a model that can be applicable in different um, counties uh, in terms of the model, the, the AI models that we are building, especially in terms of the DQI, because uh, that could make a huge difference. Uh, we, we are hoping that at some point we can actually get all of these data sets that are sitting somewhere um, and collecting dust um, into use. Um, so we started working with a couple of operators on that side. Uh, but in the in the future of this um, technology, I, I think one thing that we would love to see is to, to get to a point that we can actually do predictive work um, instead of just a post-mortem sort of work that is used for um, for reservoir characterization um, so we can actually predict hey like if we are tr if you are drilling the well in this you know formation in this region this is going to be response that we are going to get in terms of production and in terms of the simulation success um, the the comparison of the effectiveness of the simulation programs and completion programs is huge when it comes to saving cash uh, for operators and operational efficiency. Um, and we are hoping that this can actually help because this was a missing piece from the, the microseismic vendor, from the microseismic vendor to the operator to actually get value out of these data sets. Um, the other thing that I can see in the future, and there are so many good startups out there um, started doing this, and maybe some of the bigger operators that are doing that internally is to look into integration of these data sets with other data streams that are collected in in the in the Permian Basin for compilation programs, um, and that's a huge plus because uh, we are technically looking at um, things that can go uh, hand in hand to solve that puzzle that we are all trying to, to solve as engineers and geos. Awesome, sounds exciting. Okay, and another question. Um, when you're building the three and three and 4D models, uh, what are the parameters you look at to, uh, that we would look at to build our models for 3D Start and 4D? What are the parameters? 
Yeah, I believe that's the question. What are the parameters to look at for building the models? Um, so in terms of clustering, if that's what you're referring to, um, in terms of clustering, you can do your clusters in 3D. You can just use a space, um, which technically looks at events one by one and looks at the relationship in a space, which is X, Y, Z, so that's 3D. Uh, when you're looking, when you're adding the component of time, you're actually adding one more restriction to it. So you will say, hey, like, here is a volume of rock. I'm looking at it. And this is the space that I'm dealing with. I want the, you know, the event um, spacing to be this specific amount, but also I want the events to happen within, within a specific time window. Um, and that's how you can actually do the, the 40 uh, clustering which to me is very powerful because marketizing data and completion in general, it happens in time. Um, you have about two hours or an hour and a half or sometimes three hours to treat a sage. And as you're treating the sage, you are, um, you are streaming the data. And this data, its distribution is different um, at time zero to time you know, 120 minutes elapsed time from the beginning of the stage. So it has to be the, the data that is produced has to be treated differently. So a spatial temporal modeling or a spatial temporal clustering um, is a way to, to actually in, bring in that fourth component that is really important statistically um, to look at the characteristics of uh, the, the seismic events, uh, but also the characteristics of the reservoir and how it actually reacts. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question, uh, do you use other technologies, for example, tracers to create the models or is it only based on micro seismic data? So um, these applications and what we have talked about um, here, they're actually just using micro seismic data. Um, however, we had multiple projects that, you know, the operators had other type of data streams. Um, such as tracers, which I think tracers are really good in terms of how far um, you know, your simulation goes um, and how effective it is, which are done right now. They're not automated. They are not put into applications, but they are done as some interpretive work that um, we have done with different operators. But if you do have those sort of data sets, um, I think the next step is that bringing them into applications such as these ones that I just showed is really simple to do. And that thanks to, you know, the digital technologies, um, how they are evolving and how advanced they are um, and how, you know, cloud computing makes a huge difference in, you know, the timing that is spent in reviving the data and using the data um, and calculating relationships. Um, so if you do have those sort of data sets um, in, in your in your hard drives, in your softwares, in your in your computers, um, it's really good to bring them out and provide them along with the micro seismic data to be built in into the applications that are built. Um, we would do that um, in a hard bit. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, the next question: How has activity been for your work in this low price environment? That's a good question. So actually, the 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 low price environment actually helped with uh, with getting these applications off the ground. Um, and part of the reason is that usually operators are so rushed into into getting things done, right? Um, you have to drill, you have to you have to complete, you have to produce, you have to drill, and the loop is just going on and on and on. Um, and this pandemic, the elephant in the room, let's talk about the pandemic and the low prices, um, it actually created a little bit of a room for people to actually sit back and think about what they've done in the past, which bring us here talking about, hey, like if you have $40 million data sitting in your, um, in your office, you can actually get them to, to put them to, into use um, and can use them for future uh, projects to optimize those projects and save cash. So these projects, technically, in terms of pricing, they are 
lower in pricing compared with one by one work done. Because majority of times when market assessment projects are done, operators want a second opinion, want a third opinion. So they reprocess the data and they end up with having three different data sets from one site. And at the end of the day, each vendor who reprocess the data will tell you that my processing is better than the other one. So you really don't have a clue um, which one is actually better than the other one. You just have three opinions that you can compare uh, with each other. Um, but these and every single one of those reprocessing projects is actually more expensive um, if you want to reprocess your data over and over and over. Uh, the better way is to clean up your data set um, and use the one that you actually received right at the beginning, which reduces the cost of doing that work. Um, but the low price of low price environment, it actually helped operators to realize that they can put their data in use. And it provided us with the opportunity to actually work uh, with a couple of companies. Actually, right now, um, we have, I think, four ongoing um, relationships and projects with four of the operators in Permian uh, that are mid and large size companies. Um, and that that's really helpful in terms of their understanding of their data, but also us pushing the technology a little bit even further. Okay, uh, this next question kind of seems to follow along with what you were saying just now. Uh, would these analytical models help reduce costs, costing in the coming times of ENP? Yeah, absolutely. And um, honestly, it's I'm I'm keep saying that there are so many other startups coming in with new technologies such as ours, which are really helping to slash costs for future for future work. And the way that it works is that if you can do predictive work, if you can tell um, what sort of completion program can can work better than the other, um, you're golden. That's the holy grail, right? Um, so for for completion programs, just imagine we we had one project that um, it, they had about 15 marketizing projects in very like close region. Um, all the paths were very close to each other. We built a really good AI model that was really optimized with the data, and then we tried to do some predictions based on the new wells that they they are going to to drill. And they also had PLT data, which was really helpful um, for the, the wells that they already drilled. Um, and we it ended up looking at completion programs and figuring out that they are pumping for too long for every single stage that they are treating. And just thinking about each stage costing thousands and thousands of dollars in terms of treatment, and if you can cut it back for half an hour or even 15 minutes, it saves a lot of money um, in, in terms of the operational costs when you're completing the, the, the wells. Um, so this absolutely can help for, for future work that is done, but also it brings in value when you think about your data investment, because at some point you made a decision over the last 10 years that, hey, I'm gonna acquire this type of data set. I always say the, I think the geophysicists, especially the geos are kind of data hoarders. We, we collect a lot of the data, but then it gets over overwhelming and then we don't have the tools to put them all into play. So if you can actually get that, that, that data to work for you, that's, that's, a, that's a way forward as I see it. Okay, next question. Um, what are they utilizing as their training data set? Uh, is it provided by the operator in order for them to create a validation data set and then doing some a sort of time series analysis? Um, that's a really good question. So for, for, the, tr for the training data set um, or the set, uh, we are actually doing the work on our own. So um, as I said, I come with the background of working in a market seismic company and I do have colleagues that have more than 25 years of experience in passive seismic. Um, and we already have our ways of cleaning up and labeling the data. Um, so that's the part that we do. So let's say if you have 10 projects um, that you want to um, incorporate in the model that we are building, 
we are labeling part of the data set for you. We're cleaning it up um, as experts uh, with looking at the catalogs, with looking at the processing parameters that you receive from the vendors. And when your model is built and trained, then you get access to that model. Um, and then if you're adding other projects to that um, application, the applications that looks like the same that I was showing you, um, then you can actually clean up your data set using the model that we already built for you. Um, here and there, there are companies that are like, okay, well, you know, we want to expand our model and we want to provide more data uh, for the model. We can always incorporate that. That won't be an issue. But also you can you can export the models and you can look at them if you know if you are code savvy and you're um, you're willing to go the extra mile of uh, figuring things out on your own. That is possible as well. Okay. Uh, next question uh, says I'm not sure I understand the data quality assessment. When the catalog is able to flag high and low quality data. Um, so the way that it works, I guess that, that's a really good question. So um, I think I went, I'm just going to go to this slide because I think you can still see my screen, right? Uh, yes, we can. All right. So, oh, damn it. I think I have to choose it here. Oh, there you go. So here's an example, and this is just a GIF that shows um, uh, the data collected for a couple of stages within a project. Um, this is this is called the scaling relationships. Um, so depending on the features that you receive, the microseismic attributes that you are receiving in your catalog, um, you can plot up your data in in such platforms, such uh, plots. Um, these are just some of the examples of these sort of plots which uh, shows how you can actually look at the data and figure out which pieces of data are unbiased. So for example, one of the things that always comes into mind is um, the data sets uh, that are acquired closer to the array, they have smaller magnitude events. The reason is because it's closer to the detection array. So obviously um, you, can, you can collect a lot more data closer to the detection array. So clearing those sort of biases, but also looking at some of the parameters as we talked about, like apparent stress and a stress drop, and the self-similar behavior of microseismic events when they are happening for hydraulic fracturing, it will actually provide us with a way to clean up a portion of the data that physically makes sense. Because some of the majority of times when you look at the processing artifacts and the quality of the events that are processed um, is, most of it is they don't physically make sense. Um, so with doing the cleanup and slicing and dicing the data and looking at trends and scaling relationship, you can actually come up with, with a really good representation of, um, of high quality data set that you can actually rely on. Um, there are so many parameters that you can look in terms of the signals, um, such as SNR, like you can see how the SNR is used here for for just filtering out a piece of the data set, uh, which are the, the colored ones in the darker color shows the better quality events, or the confidence number. The confidence number is technically um, part, you know, a bunch of parameters that goes into the processing, such as errors associated with azimuth, um, associated with the location of the events, the number of the picks, and so many others uh, that helps the experts to to qualify an event as a good quality event versus a not good, not good quality event. And then when we are talking about the, the QC process, um, if you look at it in sense of does this thing suffers from, micro, from processing artifact, they are very easy to pick up when you look at the data. Uh, the artifacts that are associated with velocity modeling, the artifacts that are associated with azimuth error, um, they are very easy for experts to pick up when they are looking at the data. So these information um, helps us to label the data as the, the part of the data set that you can actually trust and you can use in your interpretation. 
uh, and the part of the data that you're better off not use it. But the, the bigger piece of these application is that you have the choice. You can, you can use those events or you cannot use them. But you do also have all the data that comes from the engineering side. So you can compare. Um, in 99% of our results for ProSRV and the data that we are providing to the operators, they think that the data really matches the rest of the information that they are getting from other monitoring uh, streams uh, and data, but also they are getting a really good match with their FRAC models, uh, which is also a big deal. So um, it's just a matter of getting to that point. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, can you comment on the downfalls of using uh, def deformation as a proxy for production? With larger data sets now, which are a function of co-development, infill drilling, parent-child, child-child interactions, etc., we see more events uh, are not always and often not correlated to increase EOR. If the clustering is, essential, uh, is essentially using uh, deformation, seismic mo uh, moment, would newer large data sets intrinsically show a greater SRV than old ones from uh, standalone wells? That is a really good question, and I'm really glad that you brought this up. Um, that is kind of, there is this misconception um, within the hydraulic fracturing community that, oh, if you get more events, that means that you, you really rock the rock and it's, um, it's producing uh, way more than where you don't have as many activities. It's not a linear relationship. Um, and I think a smart people such as you, that you ask this question, uh, it, it, they understand that, that there is no linear relationship between, between the number of the events that you are receiving uh, versus, um, versus the production. Um, the way that we are calculating the formation, it is not just looking at the number of the events. So it doesn't have a linear relationship with the events. Um, there is way more math behind it and I can share that with you um, just reach out and we can chat about it uh, but just in, in short to respond to this question um, you as someone who's looking at these data sets um, the automation the AI helps to a specific point at the end of the day you're the interpreter sitting um, behind uh, the wheel you are looking at different data sets that you have so let's say for example if you have a depleted zone that is very close by um, to your well, obviously that will affect um, the distribution of the seismic events around the well. Um, there are ideal cases and there are cases that are not very ideal. Um, and that's, um, that's where your knowledge and your project knowledge comes in. Uh, what these applications and what these technologies are providing for you is to fast track everything to get to that point that you can actually pick up on irregularities and you can actually come up with why it is happening. Um, the, we all wish that Earth, the Mother Earth, would, would be simple and we can everything was linear, but unfortunately it's not. And the, the human interaction with, with, the, with the subsurface is actually affecting a lot of things. So most of the things that we see, um, it's less about structural elements like faults and those sort of things. It's mostly about depleted zone and how the parent and child wells are interacting with each other. And they have to be taken into consideration when these models are built, but also afterward when you're receiving the results from these models. And the thing that these application provides is that it puts you in a driver's seat when you can choose and pick which one makes sense and which one doesn't. Because at the end of the day, you build a model based on you know, a large amount of data that you already had, it doesn't mean that it's always 100% true for whatever projects that you throw at it. Um, that's just like pure science and how it works, right? Okay, uh, next question. Is KNN uh, clustering the only model applicable in such, a, in such scenarios or are there others too? Um, I think there are other uh, clustering methods that can be used. I think one of the reasons that we chose to go with KNN is, is because it's quite faster and it actually um, delivers really um, presentable results compared with other clustering methods. You obviously can use 
you know, the clustering method that is applicable for you or you, you wish to. But for our application, we tested, I think, multiple clustering algorithms and we figured out that the KNN, which is almost as like the rule of, um, you know, keep it simple is stupid. Um, the simplest kind of clustering method works actually the best. Um, and it, the, the, the algorithm that we have is very optimized because clustering, especially if you're dealing with a lot of data sets, it's, uh, it's a time consuming process. Um, so it depends how much resources you have for in terms of computation, how big your data set is and what sort of clustering method you want to use. But that, that was the case that, um, that was the one that we chose to go with. Okay. And another question, uh, what was the full form for SRV? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Um, that uh, what was the full form for SRV? And what sure. full, full form mean? That's what, I, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Uh, pro oh, is it just SRV. like, yeah. Like, what does SRV like, mean? Oh, oh okay. Sorry. <laughs> We're just so used to these like acronyms yeah. that we use all the time. I, I think that's what the question is. Yeah. That, that's I, think, I think that's true. right. That, that makes sense. That's it. Um, so SRV is a standing for stimulated reservoir volume. Um, and technically that's a region of the rock, the formation uh, that is affected by uh, treatment program. Um, so as you're fracking the rock, um, the, the fractures that are generated, induced, or um, reactivated, uh, they go to an extent from the well bore. Um, I think I had an image earlier here that you can see. Um, so if you look, if you imagine that these are, some of these are pre-existing fractures and some of them are technically induced within, when you're fracking the rock, um, as you can see, if you're getting away from the well bore, um, the fractures are getting more and more isolated. And when you have, you know, isolated fractures, um, technically your permeability is not as high, so you can't produce as much um, closer to the well bore because you're plumbering the rock uh, with, with fluid and propane that you're um, pumping into the rock. Um, you get way more connected network. And we, we call we call this pro SRV or productive SRV, but it's essentially the high potential region for production, and that's usually to you know hundreds and two hundreds of feet from the well bore uh, when your you know your um, hydraulic fracturing um, effectiveness will go by. Um, usually after um, a couple of hundred feet away from the well bore. The, the, the seismicity gets dissipated and that's because the fractures are getting more and more isolated and they are not connected to each other. So they won't really have a huge effect in when you're producing from the well bore. So pro SRV is just showing what region of the rock has the highest potential for production. Okay. One final question. Um, this one actually comes from Anthony and I. Uh, for those of us that are trying to uh, get into the data science realm, uh, you know, uh, kind of break into that kind of field, things like that, trying to uh, better understand what it is and, and uh, you know, increase our own competencies. Um, what would you recommend uh, for us to, to kind of get started on that, uh, to, to do in order to kind of get a good handle on, on data science and data science in the oil industry? Um, there, there are so many resources out there. And that's one of the things that I, I love about data science. You don't actually have to have a degree in data science to be called data scientist. Um, you, can, you can have access to so many resources to, to get used to um, algorithms and processes that goes into slicing and dicing the data. One thing in and I think our industry in general is a bit different from maybe tech industry or the other industries. Um, we are very um, connected to our domain expertise. So if you're a petroleum engineer or if you're a geophysicist or geologist, 
you have a lot of domain expertise and I think that's the, the part that makes us stronger compared with generic data scientists that are coming out of schools with computer science degrees. Um, you know, in my team, we do have data engineers and data scientists and some of them, they have pure um, uh, degrees in computer science. They're really good in wrapping their head around algorithms and writing of algorithms, but when it comes to looking at the data, I've seen data being plotted upside down because to them, the data means nothing, right? Um, so for some of us that want to get to the realm of data science, I think the fact that we need to recognize our domain expertise is the piece that is actually very powerful um, and we have to double down on that one, but also the fact that there are so many resources out there to, to get familiar with, with um, some of these processes that are used. And I'm not talking about people like sharing, oh, here's a cheat sheet for machine learning algorithms. I'm talking about, you know, very, you know, a lot, there are a lot of actually universities that are offering courses on um, different, um, you know, coding packages um, and different um, conceptual uh, courses and theory behind how you can actually get into the data, how, how to get from, you know, a step one that is like data wrangling to the end when you're actually teasing out trends and, and um, patterns from your data sets and how to present them. I think one, one thing that is always missing for, or at least it's been missing um, from our industry is the presentation of the results. Visualization is the key. Um, and how you're presenting your results um, to, the, to the end users, that's, um, that's huge. Um, there's so many resources out there. Um, I can share those with you afterward if you're more interested. But um, I think we are at a very, um, at a tipping point in our industry. And I really like the fact that people are getting more and more into, hey, like I got a ton of data, how do I use it? I'm gonna go figure out how to use this data set. Um, one thing that I really love um, and I used to do a lot um, previously before my obligations changed a little bit was to do a lot of um, practice with Python and data sets that were freely available. If you're in an oil and gas company, you have access to a lot of data sets. So data is not an issue for you. Um, it's just a matter of um, getting used to getting used to some of these coding languages. And I think Python is just fantastic. Um, and integration of Python with so many of these um, um, applications out there that allows for visualization, um, it's, uh, it's the holy grail, pretty much. Okay, thank you for that. Hey, and thank you, Ellie, for your presentation. Uh, appreciate it, it was a great one. Um, and I appreciate all the uh, questions and answers. Uh, I really enjoyed that part as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we will uh, go ahead and close out the session for today. And uh, and again, if you need to reach out to Ellie, she does have her uh, contact information there. Feel free to do that as well and uh, reach out to us with any questions as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great awesome. afternoon. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.